Welcome everyone to another episode of Brains Plot, bringing you amazing stories from real individuals dealing with technology and the impact it had on their lives. I'm your host Ron Leyun and today we have a special remarkable guest with us, Ezio Momail. Welcome Ezio, an inspiring instructor who helps professionals in developing a winning mindset as well as building leadership capabilities. But that is not all it. Ezio is also a father of a beautiful family and a fantastic friend that many people are so proud to have. Ezio, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Roland. Absolute pleasure. Man, it is my pleasure. I've been waiting for this time for so long now. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to it. So before we start our conversation, yeah. let's take a moment to introduce Ezio to our viewers um, who may not have been familiar with this remarkable person. Um, I have made a short clip and it's already, uh, the viewers will actually see it yep. and it will be an introduction to Ezio. Hi, I'm Ezio Mormal. I work with athletes, elite athletes, World Cup players, Olympians, male and female teams and individuals. And my passion is around corporate athlete. I do a lot of work, not only with them personally and as teams, but also do a lot of work looking at research to leverage uh, in the corporate world what, the, what works in the sport world, so things around resilience, technical, physical, tactical elements, and how we can, you know, activities like visualization and whatnot, body language, self-talk, all of these elements that as athletes, they master to go to the next level that we can also incorporate into our own lives and also in our corporate lives as corporate athletes. Uh, so I'm continuing to build that out, always looking to work with more and more different organizations and sporting teams and if you have any questions of any interest, just reach out to me at it. It's your, as we all know, um, everyone has to start from somewhere. And often uh, that, story, that starting point could be at school, within your family, or even in the neighborhood where you grew up. Um, tell us a bit about your life. How did it all start up? Yeah, I grew up in Wollongong, so it's a very industrial town. Uh, my family were immigrants. One of four children went to school down there. I uh, liked school, and um, but I got into uh, university after school. Failed miserably. Did IT, just didn't get it, didn't like it. But then moved into some leadership programs, and I enjoyed that. Kind of enjoyed the leadership side of things, the people side, being able to guide people, lead people, and whatnot, and the connection with that and technology. But motivation was always of interest to me, and I was always curious on how people make decisions, just how we decide what to do, what not to do. And then that kind of got me into the corporate world. I uh, started working with um, different er elements around operations, sales. Uh, sales was interesting too for me around the psychology of buying, you know, how people buy, why they buy, and then the particular team dynamics. Team dynamics always interested me, how we make decisions. You know, whenever there's more than one person, it's always curious, the criteria, the process. So I uh, worked in sales for a while, that was, that was enjoyable. I love it, for me sales was like a sport. And I say it's a contact sport, it's a team sport, it's a contact sport. You win, you lose, there are rules. You know, there's the disappointment, the resilience. You need to understand you know, what you're doing, your value proposition, your strengths, your opportunities to grow. Uh, then I moved into facilitation. Again, I like that element. Uh, because I learned so much too, you learn from the people you work with, you know, you ask questions and those kind of things. So really that was my journey, but um, then I always wanted to get into psychology. I was, again, I was curious psychology, how to make decisions. Psychology, from IT to psychology. Yeah, well, even, even for me, you know, if you look at, say we look at IT, we took a look at companies like Meta or, or those kind of organizations, even Netflix. You know, even the psychology around how they find customers, how they retain customers, how they keep us connected for me that's the psychology how they drip feed the information how they, the algorithms know what Roland is interested in at what time of the day and those kind of things so there's still a lot of so almost they are masters they're almost too good at it yeah too good <laughs> uh, because to me that's the the technology it turns out how it works but what I'm interested in is you know how they capture the minds of people yeah. and how they maintain that attention again almost too much uh, I talk about so I work a lot in high performance and talk about the F word so even with the athletes, uh, corporate CEOs, whatever, the F word for me is always focus, you know. And those companies are masters at attracting your focus, your attention, and then maintaining it. Mm -hmm. You know, for so people jump on initially for three minutes and an hour and a half later, you're still there, right? 
that maintained your focus. So for me, that is almost a bit of a a battle, a war, you know. I That's remember. fantastic. So this is this was your beginning. This is what you had in like in mind it, and planning all this time. It intrigued me. It intrigued me. Mm -hmm. Then I had a moment where I was at a course, and um, well, the other thing actually, which may, may throw you off a bit, but you know, when I talk about decision making, well, the other interest for me around psychology was suicide, quite frankly. Okay. Simply because it is, for me, the biggest decision we can make. And, and the consequences are very significant. So that always intrigued me around, okay, how does someone come to make that decision, right? That intrigued me, so that was of interest. So I was studying that. Did you have uh, any personal experience? It's a good question. you would know? No, but I, I know, it's a good question. But I observed a lot of people going, and different types of people, mm. from you know people in Hollywood, to friends that I mm. went to school with, to people in the corporate world, it just seemed to be everywhere. It seemed to be everywhere. There almost wasn't one obvious reason. And, and I was interested in what we knew about it. And then as I started to research, I realized there was so much we didn't know about it. So that intrigued me. Then amongst that, you know, I was in a course one day around leadership and we had a, an AFL coach come in and you know, spoke about the psychology and the impact on the athletes. I thought, well, that's really intriguing. I've never thought of that. I do like sport. So literally that night, I started building a, a business plan. I thought I'm going to have a go at this. And um, it was about eight years ago, or uh, six years ago. And I thought, I learned. See, I failed university initially. Then I went back to do psychology and mature age. Um, but I learned best by doing. That's how I learned. And making mistakes. Another F word, failure. You know? yeah. That's how I learned. And I, I'm practical. You know, I can read books as much as I like to read. but. I, so I literally, you know, I leveraged our, our sales skills. I developed a core plan, developed a, a customer to go after. Originally it was a football team uh, who I knew had aspirations to get in the A-League. And I rang the CEO, I did research on the CEO. I'd never, I never met the CEO, I knew no one at the club. Rang them, told them my pitch, what my proposition was. I told them I could build them a mindset program better than any A-League team in Australia. That was my pitch. And it took a while, but I started working originally with the academy and then the senior team. Then from there I ended up in the A-League, so I was working with the A-League team. I still am to this day, it's my fifth year. First two years I didn't get paid, but I was researching what they're doing in the NBA, in the NFL, in the EPL, uh, reading a lot of academic literature, making contacts and building my network, building my research, my curriculum. And last year we won the A-League, Central Coast Mariners. So Congratulations, I was there. that's really good. Well, it was a proud achievement for the whole club. They had great coaches who were very visionary, Nick Montgomery and his assistant Sergio. But we, have, we had the lowest budget in the league. So we played Sydney FC, Melbourne City, Melbourne Victory, Western Sydney Wanderers. We beat Melbourne City in the grand final 6-1. They had three players on the field worth more than our entire squad. You know? So the beauty there was we, we had to think differently. I say think is another effort. You know, mm. because that's, that's, it was very, so we had to think differently. We didn't have the money, we didn't have, but so we put a big emphasis on developing our athletes holistically, yeah. technically, physically, tactically, but also mentally. So they are they are resilient. They can handle the pressures up and down yeah. of a full season, a full game. Believe it or not, even in um, in sport, the ability to focus is huge. So there's more and more, more and more, even in professional football, more and more goals are being conceded in set plays because in set plays the defence mm. lose focus. Relate the attack knows what they're going to do. The defenders just a fraction of a second lose focus, can see go. So we do a lot of work around self-esteem, self-talk. I talk about international languages. I always ask the athletes who speaks another language, and, and you know less and less nowadays. But I say we all speak other languages. You know, body body language is important, both in sport but in life. How we show up, you know, how we present ourselves, uh, but also self-talk. You know, the little mind in our head. I don't care if you're a CEO or I work with World Cup soccer players, you know, uh, players overseas, everyone has self-talk, you know, and, and it's not always good, often it's negative, you know, we have automatic negative thoughts. So that's my role in the club and, and what I had there was the opportunity to actually do it, because you, know, you can read all the books you want and you can watch the movies, Netflix, whatever you want, but I was very lucky, I had a visionary coach, visionary assistant coach. And they allowed me to do those things. You know, I had. A, I remember we went nine games without a win. So, mm -hmm. me, I had to come up with a strategy to address that. You know, and uh, 
I was nervous, but I was like a little kid because I thought I'm there. I'm actually, you know, I'm in the middle of this. I get to try things and, and you learn, you know, by what works. Not everything works. So yeah, that that's I guess that's my story. That's how I came to be. And um, you know, for me, it was always, always learning and and uh, and I plan. I love to plan. I, I it may not look like it, um, but I plan a lot. I even to the point I've written my eulogy. Uh, Twenty years ago, 20, 23, I wrote my eulogy. Uh, I, every Sunday I review my week and I plan my next week yeah. and I do that almost religiously even when I, I keep a journal for 26 years I've kept a journal pretty much every day I write down what I did who I spoke to what, how I felt what I learnt um, what I was feeling bad about you know how I will do that and it allows me to go back many many years it's a, it's a treasure for me so going back many many years yeah. um, what was the role of your parents and do you have oh, a big family, yeah. brothers, sisters? Yeah, I have a big. What was the influence on them? Well, I'm the youngest. I'm the youngest by ten years. Okay. I was a mistake, which is probably self. Pretty sure it was a mistake because my parents had me when they were older, and I was ten years between me and the others. So that's a good question you ask. I had a very loving family. I say, my both my parents passed away. We grew up. We never owned a car. We never went on holidays. Oh. We lived in a very industrial town, but I, I grew up privileged because my parents showed me a lot of love. And in fact, when my mother died six years ago, I said she died a very rich woman because I define how rich you are based on what you own, what you need, not what you own. And we didn't need much. We grew a lot of our own crops. <laughs> we ate very simple foods, but we were happy. And, and the group of people I grew up with, I still stay in touch with. And we had people in that group, some became senior executives, some ended up in jail, some took different roads, didn't matter. But together, even to this day, we are, we are still connected. You know, I can ring any one of them now if I need something. I know even the ones who went a little bit off the rails, that they, they, they would help me. So, and, and to me, you know, it's interesting because I think today as a father, now, we, you know, in those days, the parents would call us to come into the house. Yeah. Nowadays, we're, 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 we're to get, get, out, get, to get out of the house. Exactly. You know? That's what we're all experiencing now. And there you go. This is so well, but we learned there to get together. We had people from different cultures. Um, different value or something same value but different different interests and we just work together and, and we shared we learned from each other we would even my parents that would give food to neighbors and vice versa um, you would have disagreements with your friends and, yeah. le and learn the art of um, of coming back together and reconciling you know because we had to because he was the only person in the street that had a cricket bat you know so we, we, had, to, we had to keep letting him come back and I was, we had no, you know it, it was a simple lifestyle have you ever considered yourself as a leader so do you want to lead by example and show other people that you can actually do it on your own and then people can learn from you uh, this this part of you becoming an instructor and because obviously you would have uh, a message that you want to yes. send out, out there well leadership for me is very important and for me the most important leadership role I have is as a father you know because for me that's the number one role yeah. and I have that even in my eulogy around uh, around leadership and leading my family so it's something I'm very passionate about and I think we're always learning as leaders I don't think they're necessarily born you can develop into a leader uh, and we're always learning so yeah I always enjoyed that responsibility but for me I say it's not so much always leading depends how you define it is influencing is the ability and sometimes for me some of the greatest leaders are able to influence but you know they are not the, on the org chart, the leader, or they don't have the armband, but that person is has an impact on the group of people, mm -hmm. the influence by what they say or how they say it, and the ability to influence. Do you have someone in mind that you, you actually remember now? One of the leaders that you actually think about it? Y yeah, as, in my life. As an example, yeah. Uh, well, I think my father was, was a good leader for the family, but probably recently, yeah, Nick Montgomery now is coaching in Scotland. He was a good leader, he was able to have, and he still is. He had great vision. He, he empowered his staff. He recruited staff who were different to him, which to me was a sign. He, I remember, so I got interviewed recently for a newspaper in Scotland, oh. and they asked me about him. They said, well, can you tell us about Nick? I said, well, listen to his press conference. And, and in his press conference, one of the things he said was that his assistant manager is smarter than him. And to me, that's leadership. Not yeah. many people come out, first day press conference, new club, and say, oh, you know, my assistant is smarter than me. And what he meant, of course, was, you know, technically and tactically, he was smarter than him. And that's why he recruited him. So mm -hmm. to me, a great leader knows what capabilities are required to achieve the goal and recruits people 
for those roles and then empowers them to deliver it, you know. And he was able to do that. The other thing for me was, you know, he said in his press conference, uh, he will give young young players a go. He put a 16-year-old on, never been done for that club, right, in, in 60, 70 years. So that's another interest for me, is how we develop talent. And that's part of leadership, developing talent and accelerating talent development. Because all players and athletes, if they train, even in the corporate world, will get better, is about getting better faster. That's why I even challenge the idea that when leaders come out and say, we're gonna work harder than anyone else. Yeah. My interest in high performance and working with World Cup athletes and, and, and whatnot, they all work hard, is you gotta be smart as well, right? You gotta be smart because everyone is working hard. And this is right? what you're teaching your kids now. Just well, with my kids, smarter. athletes, yeah. yeah. To think, again, I call it the F word, yeah. you know, to think, to reflect, um, what worked, what didn't work, what what do I look like when I'm at my best? So I do a lot of work with the athletes and whatnot around what are our strengths. It's amazing how many people, even in the corporate world or sport, when I ask them what are your strengths, can't tell me. Mm. They can't tell me. Maybe some are shy, but all the great athletes, and this is why I use the idea of like a corporate athlete, they know their strengths and they leverage their strengths, especially under pressure, especially under pressure, because Federer will know they'll come under pressure and they will go to that shot because that, they, that is their go-to yeah. shot, even though the competitor knows, but, but they know that's their shot. And likewise, even our children, you know, they, we should be working with them to help them identify their strengths, learn new strengths, but uh, build that capability at a young age, this sense of achievement, you know. 100%. Um, you know, I have a concept I use with the athletes and, and even my children around mountains, building mountains. Every great achievement I use in that. Everything I talk about, nothing is original. I, I, I borrow it from everywhere, books, literature, whatever, research that I, I study. And there's a great concept around you know, listing every great achievement and, um, and, and you draw a mountain for all your great achievements in life because a mountain represents struggle and then you have the view. And of course, every great achievement in our lives will involve struggle. I don't care who you are. In, no, nobody says my greatest achievement is watching 10 hours of Netflix. Mm. You know what I mean? That's not great. And, and, and then visual, I'm big into visualization. That's why the athletes use it. We use it all the time to visualize success. And, and we draw, we draw, we draw our mountains for every great achievement, draw a mountain. And then you get conditioned where something is happening in life and you say, Roland, that's a mountain. You can talk about that. That's another mountain. We will all end up with mountain ranges. To get to where we are in our lives, you, you, you obviously had a lot of success. But you know, one of the things I learned, and so I, I carry the spare brain, is that the brain, how the brain works uh, around memory is quite intriguing because often our failures, we say like a Velcro, mm. they stick. We remember, I screwed that, I lost that deal, I lost that game, I failed to do that, I didn't get that interview, whatever. It's like Velcro. But our greatest achievements, like Teflon, we forget. Forget about them, yeah. And our job as parents or leaders is to remind people, hey, yeah, you did that a couple of years, that was really good. So it's your yeah. psychology, failed in IT, yeah. you love sports and activities. What have you been doing with telecom and IT companies for the last, I don't know, 27 years? Well, a range of roles uh, from, you know, uh, from operations, sales, facilitation. But for me, even there, it's about understanding the technology and how it applies. So even with my athletes, I leverage technology. So I can, on my phone, I can pull out interviews, surveys, I've surveyed the athletes for the last five years, six years. I can pull out players, even World Cup players, what their goals were, what their challenges were from five years ago. We do it every two months, for example. We do assessments, so I build an assessment tool um, uh, where players do it on their phone. Um, and again, it's to get them to think, to rate themselves on certain capabilities, get the coaches to rate themselves. On. We have a look, we do gap analysis. It's all about insights and getting players to think. One of the greatest privileges I get from athletes and, and corporates when I work with them is that that made me think. Mm. Right? Because often in the world we are creatures of we just go through the motion, go through without thinking. But to me, my, and again, my passion is high performance. So we leverage technologies like that. But for me, it's never about the technology itself. Um, the technology for me is an enabler. You know, I'm not into doing things because they are new, right? Um, I, the new toy syndrome, I think Jeff Bezos said, you know, the problem with new toys, they don't stay new for long, right? And sometimes I find with technology, we, we just jump to it because it's new and then we try and find a solution for it. 
Uh, I don't work like that. I, I try and understand the problem or the opportunity, and then I see where that technology can come in. And that's the same with, you know, my experience with with Telstra and, and other, other ITC companies is understanding the problem, understanding the people, um, and then understanding how the technology can be used mm. to solve that problem. And, and even then I say understanding the people because sometimes there are examples where the technology is too complicated for the people to use, right? So, so that is not solving the problem, right? Just because it's a new toy. Um, so we have to understand the audience. Uh, so yeah, that's my interest in the, in the technology part is, is enabler. So would you consider that you've done the right choice by sticking in the world of IT and telecom for the last many years? Was uh, it the right choice for you? Or you, the, do you have your doubts? Or would you say, ah, oh, should I have started something else? There's always doubts when you reflect. But for me too, the other thing with technology is the job had a, a high level of flexibility, quite frankly. So I have five children. And so the flexibility for me is very valuable, right? The ability to work from home, for example, mm. is very valuable. And so to me, for anyone considering a career in it, um, you, you need to look at other factors. But the other reason why I do encourage, for example, careers in technology is the rate of change. And for me, change is, even for my children, I think there's one thing I want my children to master, apart from you know the, the art of resilience, is adapting to change. Mm. And for me, you know, there's a great quote, change has never been as fast as it is today and it will never be as slow as it is today. Correct. Yeah, and a lot of that is being driven by the technology. If you have a AI now, you have a look where we are, where we're going, how quickly we're going to get there. Um, and, and, and that's the, you know, it's just moving at such an incredible rate for good and bad, you know, for good and bad. You know, I remember the days pre-internet, right? I remember, I remember dialing onto the internet. I remember the first thing I Googled, or, you know, on the internet. Nowadays, people, you know, would laugh at that like, like you are now. But I remember those days that to think where we're going to be in five years time. So I think for technology, the other thing, I think the relevant of technology is it doesn't matter who you are now, particularly in business or sports. In sport, we work with you know virtual reality, and those things become. Important. You could be marking Ronaldo. You know, put some goggles on, and you're marking Ronaldo, and and, and, and learning from that. It is now everyone is obligated to be across the technology, even a CEO or whatever, because of the impact, even the risks, so security, for example. If every business, every business has this obligations around security, and then of course there are other opportunities around how do we leverage opportunities, how do we stay? That's why again, I like sport. How do we stay ahead of the competition? by leveraging technology, um, you know, accelerate the de development of the business through technology. It's remarkable what's So over, over the last 27 years or yeah. more now that you've been working, um, obviously you had a project or yeah. a customer that was a key turning point that just made a big difference in yeah. the way that you're thinking, progress, or decide just to change everything, turn everything around and say, okay, it's your, this is what you should do now. Do you have a, a customer or a project or an experience that you'd like to share with us? Well, my, my best one for me a failure. You know, one big deal was a big deal. Crane Group, now called Fletcher Group. That's the group I remember well. And I worked on that deal for like a year and I lost it, but I learned a lot in that deal. One was I learned the, the art of planning. Right? You lost it as a um, business development manager? Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah, I lost it. And it was a big business, it was high profile, we had very senior executives engaged. Um, and I realized my gaps in as I went for that deal, there were things I didn't know that I should have known, such as the decision making process. Who was who in the business? They had lots of decision makers. What was their compelling event? Why were they even doing it? Mm. And, and I had a very good leader, Shane Bywater, who, who gave me a lot of room to move, but I lost that deal and it hurt. Um, but I learned a lot from that deal around the art of planning, the art of strategizing, the art of talking to the right people, the art of stepping away from the deal or the moment, even in life, and and having a plan, testing the plan with the right people, even people mm. that don't always tell you what you want to hear. Um, so it was a big moment, you know, it was a big deal to lose. It was a big deal. Um, but I remember it well, and um, that were the lessons for me. You know, it was a significant. We presented to the board. We had very, as I said, very senior people from Telstra, um, and I remember getting a sense at a certain point that we weren't going to win it because there was like five divisions, and I really, it was like an election campaign for me. I needed three seats to win, you know. And actually, even one of our senior execs was confident that we won the deal. I remember we presented to their board, and 
the next day, one of my friends rang me from interstate. He said, oh, you know, the senior exec was talk, presenting today in our state. He spoke about the presentation and he's feeling really confident, you know, we're going to win. The guy's name was Mike Foster, right? So he, he thinks we're going to win. The deal went really well. Then well done, you know. I said, oh, it's good. That's great. He said, we're not going to win the deal, though. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, no, nah, no. Nah. I said, I've been on the phones talking to people in their business and um, we need three seats to win. And he got two, the other three not going to vote for us. So, so what did you learn from this? And how are you, how are you applying it now to your life um, in different fields? I plan a lot more now. I ask myself more questions. I reflect a lot more now. I challenge my assumptions, you know, where I think, all right, why am I doing that? So I rethink, you know. Um, is that the right thing to do? Is, is that this even writing my journal, you know? Um, is that really what it means? Or am I just hearing what I want to hear? Because sometimes in life, we hear what we want to hear. Yeah. That's not the re all people tell us what we want to hear, but that's not the reality. Exactly right. Uh, I realised also to talk to you know to different people, people that didn't always tell me what I wanted to hear. Um, I had to have a very good plan, and I had to test that plan, and I had to be true to the plan, to the deal. You know, re work out my, what's my gaps, what do I know, and constantly. So that's when I'm working on deals, or even in in just in relationships. The other thing I learned was you know. The most famous radio station in the world, I learned from the process. The most famous radio station in the world, WIIFM, you know. Mm -hmm. What's in it for me, you know? And so me. when I was working with all those people, was what's in it for every individual? What's in it for him? What's in it for her? Why are they interested in this? Why are they not interested in this? And, and so then my, my conversations were different. Planning for meetings, I learned in that process. Was to have a, you know, I remember I had a, a yeah. leader, Keith Masterton, every time he would get engaged, him and Foster, I had to do a meeting plan. I hated them. I hated doing meeting plans so much. When I became a leader, you know, it was one of the first things I implemented? Meeting plans, right? Because I realized the value. <laughs> I realized the value of turning up to a meeting unprepared and thinking I was going to wing it. And then I realized the value going in prepared and having our alignment, you know, having a coffee with the leaders, our leaders before the meeting with the customer so we are aligned, you know, yeah. who's coming was... What's the objective? What do we want to get out? What are they going to get out of the meeting? Right? And so that's what I learned. It was a failure. Even to this day, when I see that company or one of their trucks, I remember it. Um, we learn. You should know. never give up. You that's right. still go and win them back. Well, do you know, I can tell you now, a very good friend of mine, um, uh, Mr. Hardy, who is he's now he left Telstra, he's at another competitor. Um, he won them back at Telstra. Oh, and I was delighted when he won them back. I still, you know... Uh, took a long time, but um, anyway, that's this what we do. We learn, and no one died. You know? Exactly, no one died. That's great. That's yeah. great. Look away from deals, sports, science, and all this stuff. Technology. Technology yeah. is part of us now. We can't deny it. We yeah. can't hide. It's part of our day-to-day -day life activities, and so on. How did you see the changes over the last few years? And what do you see that, or can you see something that will just hit the market in the future? Well, AI for me is the obvious one, and the security. Do I see the change? For me, one of the changes is, I look at it this way. If I say 20, 30 years ago, the, the biggest companies in the world were probably companies like GE, Boeing, manufacturing companies, you know, globally, right? And finance, financial institutions, 20 years ago, right? Now we look at the list, we have Meta, you know, we have Alphabet. We have these AWS, Amazon, right? In my view, twenty years ago, they, they were not, they were nowhere near. Yeah. Apple, Apple was here, but you can look at Apple. I'm going to charge them for advertising. For, there, there you go. go. <laughs> there you go. They are now the heavyweights, right? They are now, so that is a fundamental change. These are companies that, even asset-wise, you could argue, don't actually own much. They do, but proportion of the balance sheet compared to the manufacturing and construction, and not only their turnover, but their level of influence. The level of influence, you know, I didn't even mention Elon Musk. So, you know, I was uh, listening to, to uh, I think, a, a podcast the other day, an ABC podcast. They're talking about, I didn't even know about this, in the Ukraine Russia war, Ukraine was planning an attack on a Russian port, or I think Crimea. And they were going to use, um, uh, they're going to do it at night with electronic um, ships, basically, surveillance, bang, bang, bang. And it was all done through satellites. And it all been planned, and the plan was to ambush the Russians. I didn't know this story. Um, it was all going to plan, and then they got to a certain point in the, in the sea, and they lost contact, right? Because um, Elon Musk with his satellites, up until the point where it crossed over into Russia, um, they weren't on, 
right? There was an agreement he had with the Russians or something that they went on. So apparently that night, the foreign minister for Ukraine was ringing him personally, demanding he turn it on, right? Demanding he turn it on. This, the plan had gone. So, so anyway, he refused. He refused. Right? Now, what's interesting about that, whatever you think, politically right, wrong, whatever, it doesn't matter. That's not the point for me. What is fascinating now is you have one individual who is essentially a business person who has that power now through the technology, right? Through that technology. So he decided not to. And, and you know, these ships and that, that didn't happen. And they got washed. He was worried about a nuclear war, right? Uh, irrespective. But so what to me now that technology is, is what is done is, is, is transfer the power, right? Transfer the power. So then now when I look at artificial intelligence, chat GPT or whatever, I think, well, where do we go in the next five years? Great opportunity. I also think, though, the impact on, you know, what technology did to construction, industry, and manufacturing in, in some countries, right? What it will do now to white collar employees, right? Where things now are automated, right? It can go on. I don't need, they don't need me now, they don't need them now. So I, I think there's massive trends. Then, and you know better than, than me, the, the, the risk involved around security, you know, right. um, how it'll be used unethically in wars, already we're seeing that. And there's probably, I'm, I'm sure, a lot we're not seeing. So I think like everything in life, there's gonna be great opportunity, but there's also enormous risk and there's an enormous unknown. To me, what is different is the rate of it. Yeah. The rate of it. You know, I heard somewhere they said, you know, the next great war that starts will not start with bullets, it will start technically. Stuff technically, countries taking down another country's um, water treatment plants or, or mobile network or, or, or hacking their GPS network so they, they can't track their or they can identify where their, their tanks are. Do you know what I mean? That, that now is like, it's changed. It's just changed where we go. Where the traditional soldier with a gun is now, yeah, still of importance, but compared to these other challenges now. And so that to me, that's the fascinating, but, but it's the rate of that change, it's the, which I think is just catching us off guard. Uh, even I go back to the brain, mm -hmm. I go back to this, to this instrument, which has not changed, right? It really, we know more about it. it. The more we know, the more we realize we don't know. But, but um, that hasn't changed in my view in capacity. There's probably arguments that IQ has gone up and the other, but, but I wonder even how much that can absorb in terms of just the rate of change. Mm -hmm rate of change. Also, I think with technology now, I go back to how we make decisions. We have more information now. But I would also argue now, maybe we have too much information. We have an overload of information. You know, you go buy a car, for example, you could be reading uh, reviews for the next six months. At some point, you've got to buy the car. <laughs> uh, so, so, on anything, and, and then how, also, you know, how do we sort through fact from fiction and opinion? Right, that's getting harder and harder. Uh, how people source their information, you know. So I, I go back to those leaders. The companies, for me, just look at who the big companies are now, and then the people behind them, right? The people behind them, and then the level of influence, and then who's influencing them. Sometimes it's unclear, right? And you, you know, so it's the governments are almost now being moved aside, right? Yep. And so that is a very interesting world, very interesting world. It's a very interesting world, and we're all waiting just to see how things will develop in the future. Well, we're waiting, but while we are waiting, there are others taking action, right? 100%. And, 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 and uh, again, whatever you think of them individually um, or personally, you think, well, that's, and, and I'm just quoting ones I know, but there'll be other people. And so it's going to be a very, you know, fascinating. And I think even, you know, you talk about, just go back to businesses in a minute. Now, it, pretty much every business you know, that we drive past today on the way home is going through some kind of digital transformation, all right? Because how they did business five years ago, the systems, the processes, and that, they, they changed, right? How people are listening to this podcast has changed from three years ago, right? You know, the, the, the conventional radio, for example, right? Uh, so just the rate of that change and uh, who's going to lead that, who's going to play what role, what are the what are the guidelines yeah. around it? It's fascinating. So, technology, sports, psychology. Etu is always busy, but Etu is a father too, yeah. and this is how I did introduce you at the beginning of yeah, yeah. this session. Um, how can you cope with having? Um, how can you cope with having a busy life that always involved IT discussions, winning, and so on? and your family life. Do you keep a balance between the two? I'd like to think so. So, time-wise, I get up four o'clock every morning. This morning, 3.30. Sunday, I sleep in till five. So, I love my mornings. That's my time. 
My kids don't get up till seven. My wife and kids. So that gives me three hours. That time I might run. It's good for me mentally, physically. And I go down to a cafe early every morning and I have time there by myself. That's my thinking time and I reflect, I write in my journal, I plan, I plan. So the other thing is I, I plan religiously. Every Sunday I, I review my week, but I don't just review my week. I break my week down into roles because for me, uh, I, have, I have a work life role, I call it a role, but my number one role is as a husband. I've been married now 26 years. That's my number one role. Uh, number two is, is as a father. I have five children from 24 to 17. That's oh, my... That's okay. yeah, thank you. And that's why I wrote my eulogy because to me, what do I want them to say when I die? We're going to die, you know. The average life in the Western world is 4,000 weeks. That's what we have, you know, 4,000 weeks. And we're all going to die. I said to my daughter, she turns 24 next, uh, next Friday. Uh, when she turned 21, you know, we're having a coffee before the party. And I said to her, you know, sweetie, congratulations, you're, you're a quarter of the way through your life. And she looked at me and said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, the average age in, in Australia is about 80.6 or 82. I said, you're a quarter of the way through. She said to me, Dad, that's a disgusting thing to say. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm in the second half. I said, at any point, I could, have, I could be replaced, either changed or, or, or taken off. Right? It's, that's the reality. So, I, so I'm, a, I'm a husband. I'm a father. Uh, I'm a brother. I'm a son. Although my parents both passed away, I have aunties, uncles. I still have my son. Uh, I, I, I run my own business. So that, that is part of that is one of my roles, right? Uh, I'm a friend, you know. Uh, I'm an uncle. So for me, when I talk about high performance, is breaking down my life into those different roles because that is the holistic approach. And one thing I always, you know, one quote always stayed with me, Roland, was uh, a beautiful quote I heard from a gentleman called Stephen Covey. He said, "No one ever lay on their deathbed saying they should have spent more time in the office." And uh, that for me is very true, right? And so I, for me, that's the, that's the purpose of life is, is knowing what my roles are. So the technology again is an enabler, uh, but I also make sure it doesn't govern my life. And there's no phone in my room. I don't, my phone is not in my room when I go to sleep. So how do you communicate with your kids? Uh, I turn my phone off. But the only time I have my phone on is if they've gone out to a nightclub or something, and um, I'll keep it on until they come home. Right? Or my wife does sleep with the phone. She's got the phone beside her. She's, oh, she's the opposite. But for me, I, don't know. I have an old style alarm clock from Kmart for 20 bucks. I've had it for years. And that's, and I turn it on and off. That's how I wake up, right? Otherwise, that, that way, so when I go to sleep, there is no distraction. I just sleep, right? That's when I recharge. Um, so, yeah, for me, even that is around planning. But, so, yeah, but I talk about, you know, my eulogy and planning my week and that. I'm amazed, Roland, how, you know, I say most people, they spend more time planning a holiday than their life. Yeah, they get one life, you know. Yeah, we, we'd be more, we'd just think, but we, we get one chance on earth. Um, and people will spend hours, weeks, planning holidays, how much they spend, where they go from here. Where, but their life, they just week by week, they just run it. They just run, they just run. And we don't think, we don't reflect. You know, I love to think to myself, what, what's a good week look like for me? Mm. As a husband, as a dad, or whatever. Uh, what, what's a good day look like? one of the beauties of keeping a journal and I didn't come up with that idea is the amount of times even now Roland I'll sit there at night exhausted and I think what did I do today we all go through it now it's amazing what did I achieve I don't even know but I'm exhausted oh and then I thought oh, I had seven meetings and then sometimes I think I don't even know what those mean but so half are probably useless you really you know you see, that's one thing we have to watch in the corporate world this addiction to being busy and this addiction to having meetings, you know. So everyone's invited to the meeting because it's easy to do. So we jump on these meetings, we don't even know what they're talking about. So back to your kids, do you yeah. follow them on uh, social media <laughs> and all this stuff? Or? So that's why I got on social media initially was to follow them. But then I realized I couldn't keep up with them. So they're on different platforms. Yeah. I say as a joke, they're on Top Tick and stuff like that, you know, TikTok, Top Tick, whatever. But they're on something. So I don't because I've realized um, I can't, I just can't keep up with them. On social media, as an IT professional, yeah, yeah. professional, um, can you actually live without social media these days? Uh, no. So I, my biggest social media one is LinkedIn. So I, I and, and in fact, I was, I've been on LinkedIn for a long time, right? Because for me, LinkedIn is invaluable for my business and for insights. So yes, I am. I do get on social media. I don't post much on it, really, except for LinkedIn. In fact, if you look at my Facebook, Instagram, I really post. But I use it to keep an eye on what my kids are doing and the athletes. 
mm-hmm. right? And the athletes, because it gives me great insights what the athletes, what they're doing, um, even birthdays for some of them that I don't know terribly well. Um, yeah, high, you know, it gives me that. So it gives me that view. So yes, I look at it, but you have to be very disciplined that it doesn't take over. You know, this idea of getting on and scrolling through and scrolling through is not is not. For, and then, and then starting to read comments. No, I don't read comments. You know, because for me, you get bitter and twisted. You get bitter. You know, there's so much. Do you have an opinion that you share? No, no. no. I always have an Why opinion. Why is that? Because I find uh, the world can be quite polarizing, and we are in a world, in my view, where Everyone likes things to be binary, a bit like technology, black and white. But in my view, a lot of issues in the world, they are not binary, they are not black and white. They often are, they're quite complicated. There are many factors. Even if you look, I don't want to get political, if you look what's happening in the world today in different continents, whether it's, it's Europe, Middle East, whatever, there are many factors. And, and A, I don't pretend to understand all the factors, right, and all the history. Um, and you have to be very careful, in my view, providing opinions because that's all they are, right? And, and sometimes you think, I don't know the context, right? I don't understand the people. Um, and that is why I am genuinely interested in, in how people make decisions. Why did the person do that? It, it appears to be a very you know, silly thing to do, selfish thing to do, but they thought about it. What, 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 what provoked that? Do you normally vote? I do vote, yeah, yeah. I, I love voting, and I actually I love. For, in fact, you, you know, you asked me earlier about my family. My 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 parents went went into sport. Dad watched a little bit more with me, but election night for us was was like grand final. That was a big thing. So I, I love, I love, and I say to my kids, you know, to engage them in the process to understand um, politics, policies, and things. But that's getting harder and harder in my view. You know, my point now you're getting into my opinion because it's hard sometimes to to understand policies. And I also think because of election cycles, it's hard even for politicians now because no one wants to make unpopular decisions, but sometimes it's the right decision. Sometimes we need to pay more tax, right? Okay. To improve something. Uh, so, and to think long term, right? Uh, so for example, I do say, I'm giving you an opinion, but and this may be controversial. Sometimes I think there are advantages in dictatorships, right? And I've said that to good I'm friends. I'm going to cut this one. <laughs> <laughs> Let me explain. Let me explain. Please. Can I explain to then dictation? This is my view. When you, have a, when you don't have to worry about an election cycle, you can make long-term decisions, potentially, in theory, that will benefit the country, right? Because you're saying, all right, in, in, we need to build more hospitals, we need more infrastructure, and when they're not popular, we're going to have to pay, we're going to have to do it, right? However, sometimes I think we become uh, chained to the two or three year political cycle where the politicians are more interested in being re-elected because that's their number one priority. Therefore, we have, to, we have to give everyone, you know, lollipops and incentives to vote for us. When in actual fact, maybe almost like a parent, you're saying, well, actually, um, the, for the next two weeks, we're going to save money so we can go on a holiday. So we're not going to eat out and we're not going to eat out and we're going to eat big. Do you know what I mean? So, so that, is, that is my call around that. I know it's controversial and obviously we don't want to live in a dictation. But the concept of planning for the long term, in theory, could work better in that process because you're saying, well, that's what we need, right? That's what we need. As opposed to trying sometimes, trying to make everyone happy, which is almost impossible, right? Because then you come up uh, you come up with a solution that where, where actually doesn't benefit anyone in the long term, mm. in the long term. So for example, one of the things I think we're missing in the West is the, the 10, 20 year plan, right? For saying, okay, well, this, is, this is our 10, 20, we're talking about technology, but the 10, 20 year plan for us, is around this, this, and this, but but if I get voted out and Roland comes in, he'll put in his own plan. And probably the first thing he'll do, in actual fact, is he'll get rid of my plan because then, when, if it succeeds, he doesn't get the credit because it's my plan, right? So, and which that happens in the corporate world too. New CEO comes in, she or he brings in a new plan, a new program, and you gives it a new name. They make changes, right? And, and you go, well, that's cool, but sometimes there's value in staying the course. Stay, that's the plan. Just stay the course, right? That's the plan. Whereas now we're almost, I get your sporting is the coach comes in and every week is changing the lineup, right? Because, but but there's, we are losing the, the structure. So that is a bit controversial. You can cut that out. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, that is an opinion you might not have expected. <laughs> um, but I would maintain there are some advantages, right? If it, it, it's purely for long term thinking, long term planning.
Let's leave it to the viewers. They, 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 they can decide. And decide. They might repeat that. They can put it in the comments below. There you go. And, um, we'll have a review of it uh, down the track. Let's go back to your four o'clock wake up every day. Yeah. What time do you sleep normally? Ah, uh, 9.30, I try to get to bed. Do you actually sleep. wake up between 9.30 and 4 o'clock? No, never. So you don't wake up in the middle of the night, check your emails, never. social media, comments, go back to sleep? I sleep, my, my, phone, my phone is not even in my room. My phone is in my office. Then I'll turn it on at 4. Uh, I look at the news and stuff like that. Um, no, no, I, uh, I try and sleep well. That's the time for me to recharge. Uh, I say it's like recharging a phone or an iPad, you know, I need to recharge. So I know my limits and even my energy, I try and work out and manage my energy. I'm up for these hours. When, when do I need my energy to be high? Again, like an athlete, when does it not to be? When do I need to be highly engaged? When can I relax, you know? Um, what do I need to be interested in? What am I not interested in? There are some things that, uh, you know, so for example, go back to technology, there's some things where I don't know how they work and quite frankly, I don't care. I just want to know how it will benefit me. Someone else can work out how it works, but that's of no interest to me because I, I don't want to invest any energy. So what is your message to the young generation now, which normally they don't sleep and they're always on social media, following up on everything. What is your message to them? Well, look at the science around sleep. Let me give you to the mix with, here's a, here's a little mix for you. Mixing technology, business, the corporate world, and health, and mental health as well, four elements. A couple of years ago, and you can Google this, the CEO of Netflix was asked to name their number one competitor. Number one competitor to Netflix. It was a couple of years ago. Do you know what they said? It was at an investor briefing. Do you know what they said? Number one competitor. What do you think they might have said? Sleep. Do you know why they said sleep? They said most of our customers consume our product at night. And if we can keep Ezio up for another hour, that's extra eyeball time, and eyeball time is their KPI. So, so Meta, Alpha, Beta, all of them, are, they, that's their measure for advertising is eyeball time. So he's sleep. And I realized, Roland, when I read that, I actually got goosebumps, because I thought this is a war, right? They are trying to, and of course, their algorithms and their analytics is probably is the best in the world. They know, they, know, they know what Roland is watching, when he watches it, they know changing habits and patterns, all right? Because he used to watch sports shows, he's not watching sports shows, now he's starting to watch horror movies, always, so something has changed, right? Uh, his, his habits have changed, he's sleeping less now, that's beautiful, we're getting more eyeball time out of him. Uh, we'll, we'll give him, feed him this one, because he'll watch this, right? We know he likes this at this time of night. For me, is look at the sign. I use the simplest analogy for not just young generation athletes, but of the mobile phone. We have to recharge the mobile phone. Why do we recharge? And the way we do that is sleep the amount of sleep and the quality of sleep. And for me, that varies. There's different statistics on the individuals and age, but that is the time I recharge. And then when I get up at four, it's like a beautiful gift. You, know, you wake up at four, it's a gift to wake up. You know, Better than the alternative, right? The good old days, but, you wake up at four just to go to nightclubs. That, you know, these days. Well, I, used to, I used to go to sleep at four. <laughs> <laughs> Now I get up at four. It's funny, but sometimes I'll be running like on a Friday or Saturday morning, um, uh, Saturday morning, Sunday morning, and I see people going home, you know. And they look, that's 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 different elements, right? And I respect that, even with my own children. I, I did that as well. But for me, uh, sleep is a treasure because, and, and and also, you know, I love the quote: "You have to enjoy your own company." You know, I love your company, but I enjoy my own company. When I go to the cafe, I sit there, I sit there by myself. That's my time. When I'm running, I'm running by myself. But I get a lot of energy off people, but I also enjoy my own company because that's my thinking time. That's the time I almost step back. What am I going to do today? What am I going to achieve today? What did I achieve yesterday? What am I going to do differently? And sometimes you just relax. You relax with loved ones or whatever. Um, but to me, that that time between four to seven. We have, uh, my, my magic number, 168. You know what 168 represents? Degrees? No. Hours in a week. Hours in a week. And I love this. I love the quote, how are you going to spend your time? Because spend is like a return on investment. We have a gift every week if we're lucky. We get 168 hours. How are you going to spend it? What's going to give you, what activities will give you your best ROI? But to get my best ROI, I need to sleep. Like I need to put fuel in my car, or, or if it's electric car, I need to I need to recharge it, right? But then, where am I going to get my best time, my best return? Some of that will be in education, reviewing things, literature, staying ahead of the game, doing research. Some of it's having a coffee with a family member. So I try and have even 
regular coffees with my children right? because I also had this realization that I have coffees with customers. I had a coffee with you earlier. It was very nice. You shouted me a coffee. Thank you very much. They're, they're very important. And it's fine. Uh, yeah, very, very nice. You know, uh, I was talking to Khalid uh, earlier outside. He was talking about how his culture is. He's half Lebanese, half Palestinian. They have a saying around drinking coffee together and where one person pours coffee for, when, in, in times of conflict they pour coffee for the other person the other person drinks it it's like a it brings people together to restore you know trust and um for me those moments uh i realized well i do that with customers why don't i do that with my own children because they're the most and my wife they're the most important relationships ever in my life right i don't care if i'm on my deathbed and and, and i've made x amount of money and i have all these exotic cars but my, my wife and children are not there or they don't respect me, then I have failed right, in my life. What have I achieved? I could have lots of money. I look, I go back to suicide rates, I look at suicide rates here of Hollywood actors where they have all the fame, not the F word, and they have all the money. And, and yeah, you could, you, you could probably name 10 of them off the top of your head. They, they, they take their own lives. Uh, or, or they need drugs to be stimulated, you know? And um, so to me, that is a sign that, that money and fame is not the answer. And there's a lot of research on that. The Harvard Grant study, the longest longitudinal study in the world, they looked at life satisfaction. And uh, even JFK was part of the original cohort. And a big part is connectedness, even amongst cultures. Again, you have a look at different cultures. The value of sitting down and having a meal with someone or coffee or simple, you know. Uh, what did, for me, what did we miss in COVID as a community? Was the lockdowns, the problems with the lockdown was we didn't, we couldn't connect with people. Right? We love to connect with people. So, yeah, the sleep for me is the foundation, right? The foundation. Fantastic. It's your, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on this platform today and hearing your incredible journey in the world of IT. Before we wrap it up, is there any advice you would like to share with the young um, dreamers who are listening to you now and they, would, they just want to progress in the world of IT? Have a plan, make time to reflect. I like to write things down, type things in. I think writing uses a different part of your brain. Think, ask yourself in five, 10 years what you want to be doing. What it look, visualize, like the athletes. That's why I use the terminology of corporate. We spend a lot of time athletes. Have something to aim for, you know? I love the quote by Michael Angelo. You know, Michael Angelo had a great quote. Apparently he said, it's better to aim high and miss than aim low and hit. You know, aim high and then work backwards. How are you going to get there? Who's going to help you? I always say it's not solo. Leadership and success is not an individual sport. Who's going to help you, whether it's family, friends, and sometimes they're people that are different to us. They have different skills. Uh, write it down. But, um, and also, you know, surround yourself with people that bring the best out of you. They're not always the people that tell you what you want to hear. But surround you. Know, there's certain people that bring the best out of you. And, and you see, you find them, you find them. And you know, so even as a parent, you're always curious with your... Um, your kids' friends, right? Is that right? You always, who, who do they bring home? Into, who do they playing with? Do they bring the? Are they a good influence? Do do they bring the best out of them? You know, and and so for me, that's part of life too. Who are the people that are going to help me be more successful? You know, and uh, but ask yourself. I always love asking questions. What does success look like for you? And and there's no direct answer for that. Sometimes that takes months to work out. That's why I love the eulogy. What does it mean for you? By the for way, me, success. success. Well, the first thing is, you know, having a, is being a, a great husband, right? Because talking about high performance, but I want to be a great husband. I want to be a great father, you know? I want to be a role model to what you really mentioned leadership earlier. Uh, I want to, in 20 years, still have a great relationship with my wife. Uh, I want to be able um, to have good quality friends. So it's a bit like social media. It's not how many friends you have, but it's the depth of those relationships that I can rely on and they can rely on me. Uh, it's being happy with the little things in life, you know, but also being able to look back on life. You know, one of the great books I read was Bonnie Ware, The Five Regrets of the Dying. The Five Regrets is interesting. Asking people when they're on their deathbed, what they're gonna, and um, often the regrets were what they didn't do, not what they did. And sometimes what they didn't do was because of fear, another F word, of what other people would think, another F word, I'll say, think is F word. Um, but, but not having a go with things because they might fail, you know? And so for me, is is have the courage uh, to have a go and stay connected. We are we are human beings, mate. We are humanistic. Even sitting down with a friend, having a coffee, they are the beautiful things in life. So it's all about the coffee. 
Actually, yeah. from, from a team of viewers, I'm preparing a really good episode on coffee. Good. A businessman who runs a coffee shop. Good. And it's all related to IT. It's going to be fascinating. Is that Harry? It wouldn't be Harry. Well, Harry, he runs yeah, the best coffee shop in the world. I'm sitting there, we do a plug for Harry. <laughs> Oh, I knew when you said good coffee shop must be Ari, number one in Australia. Exactly. Well, free coffee, Ari. There you go. He's good man. He's looking ahead. Do you think robots should replace someone as inspiring and skilled as as you is in IT? If so, how could a robot convey the same passion and motivation? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. And please don't forget to click like, subscribe and share to stay updated with our with more inspiring stories.